At any given moment, there are thousands of missing persons cases around the world. Whether the cause be kidnapping, crime, or misadventure, it's usually unclear until the person is found. But what if the missing person doesn't want to be found? These cases are called pseudocide, the act of faking your own death for the intention of escaping your current life. There are many reasons why people may fake their own deaths, including escaping debt, the police, or any other event they wish to avoid. With enough planning and effort, some have been successful, but others, unfortunately, weren't as lucky. In this video, we'll be covering three people who've tried and failed to fake their own deaths. No official announcement has been made. Mr. Holt went for a swim shortly after noon with a friend, Mr. Alan Stewart, a quarantine officer. There are many reasons for committing the act of suicide, escaping debt or legal trouble being the most common. This is exactly why John Darwin, a prison officer from the UK, decided to stage his death. After the poor financial decision of purchasing two expensive homes on Seton Carew, debt had begun to mount on Darwin and his wife Anne. To escape his financial situation, he decided to fake his own death. His plan was to go on a canoeing trip gone wrong, making it seem like he died at sea, before fleeing the country and returning with an entirely new identity after things had calmed down. So, on March 21st, 2002, around 4pm, Darwin called his wife, who was at work at the time, to give her precise instructions on what to do to make his disappearance seem believable. Darwin took his red canoe and his double-sided paddle to the Seton Carew beach, where he would set out to the Tees Bay. There, he would damage the tail of his canoe to make it seem like he'd experienced harsh waters. After abandoning his canoe in the water, John would wait on the beach for his wife, Anne, to pick him up. The two would then drive to the Durham Railway Station, a mere 40-minute trip, before Darwin would leave Durham County via train. With Darwin having successfully escaped the county, Anne was instructed to drive back to their house in Seton Carew and act as though Darwin had gone missing. After not returning for his night shift at the home house prison, Anne contacted authorities, and around 9.30pm the same day, a search for Darwin was carried out. Six lifeboats, two Coast Guard rescue teams, and various airborne police equipment was deployed to search the 62 square miles of coastline near where Darwin was last seen. But by that time, Darwin was long gone, and the only things the search turned up was his canoe and his double-sided paddle, the equipment that Darwin had intentionally left behind. During the following years, Darwin had returned to Seton Carew to join his wife, now with an entirely new name and identity. His new identity was adopted from that of a baby who had died in 1950 by the name of John Jones, and he used a black and white photo of himself to get a passport. By 2003, John Darwin had been declared dead, and his date of death was March 21st, 2002. Anne had received around 500,000 euros in life insurance and various pensions. Up until now, the plan had been executed flawlessly, and now that they had the money, John and Anne had started to get careless. The couple realized that staying in the UK was a dangerous idea, as any of Darwin's friends and colleagues could recognize him if he went outside. They considered moving to various countries, flying to Cyprus in 2004, then Spain and Gibraltar in 2005, before finally settling in Panama in 2006. However, shortly after arrival, while meeting with a man to talk about the details of their move, they allowed themselves to be pictured for the man's website, a picture that would ultimately seal their fate in the following years. This, along with a tip from a colleague of Anne's who'd overheard her talking over the phone, was enough to spark a police investigation into the disappearance of John Darwin. John and Anne Darwin knew that their cover was close to being blown, so, as a last resort, the couple decided to fly back to the UK and claim that John Darwin had experienced amnesia and didn't know he was a missing person for six years. So, on December 1st, 2007, John Darwin, now 57, walked into the West End Central Police Station in London and said, quote, I think I am a missing person. Following this announcement, Darwin's friends and even two of his sons were surprised to hear that he was still alive. However, UK police had already suspected that something suspicious had been going on behind the scenes. A police investigation, along with the aforementioned photograph that was taken of the couple in Panama in 2006, led to the arrest of John and Anne Darwin on suspicion of fraud, and were later charged with insurance fraud and using deceptive practices to obtain a passport. The story of the couple spilled into the news with worldwide media coverage. 
The subsequent trial was heavily reported on and both John and Anne Darwin were sentenced to six and a half years in prison. Pseudocide is a very interesting concept that's been adapted to the screen many times, commonly used as a literary trope in popular shows and movies. Some of the most well-known examples are in Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes and the critically acclaimed movie Gone Girl. The causes for these pseudocides typically being revenge or money, but a cause that's not often mentioned is pseudocide for political gain, an event that happens more often than is depicted in the movies. This is true for the case of Arkady Babchenko, a Russian journalist who was thought to have been assassinated for his outspoken political views. Arkady Babchenko had stumbled upon the field of journalism in the early 2000s after being conscripted into the Russian military. He had previously fought in both Chechen wars, a topic on which he later wrote memoirs about. By 2009, Babchenko had become a freelance writer for several foreign news outlets, including the BBC and The Guardian, typically reporting on conflicts in Ukraine and Syria. But as he became increasingly aware of the politics surrounding his country, he began to develop more and more of an anti-Russian sentiment, a stance that he typically supported in his articles. He'd publicly spoken out against the Russian government for the bombing of Aleppo and the annexation of Crimea, boldly calling Russia an aggressor. This sentiment in Babchenko's articles very quickly put a target on his back, and as time went on, the target only grew larger. In 2016, a jetliner with 92 passengers on board, including government officials, humanitarian workers, and soldiers, crashed into the Black Sea. The crash killed 92 passengers on board, a devastating accident which led Russia into a national day of mourning the following day. However, Babchenko had other opinions on the issue. On the day of the crash, he decided to post on his Facebook, saying that he had no sympathy nor pity and that he didn't express condolences to the victim's family or friends. This post on his Facebook account threw him into the public eye even more so than before, for his outspoken position against the Russian government and the actions of Vladimir Putin. Threats from across the country started pouring into the journalist's home in Russia. Russian politicians and government officials called for Babchenko's citizenship to be removed, but in the process of this media frenzy, his home address was leaked to the public. Realizing that it was becoming increasingly dangerous for him and his family to keep living in Russia, he decided to move to various countries, moving first to Prague, then to Ukraine, where he stayed in Kiev, the nation's capital. In the following years, tensions would only grow between Russia and Babchenko, but would finally hit a boiling point in May of 2018, when news reports claimed that Babchenko had been assassinated in his home in Kiev after returning home from running errands. For many, the motive of the killers was clear, the assassination clearly being connected to his anti-Russian reporting. A picture of Babchenko's body was even circulated around the media, confirming that he'd been shot. Condolences from European politicians had spread throughout social media, and the story was widely reported on. Although, the condolences soon turned into shock, as the next day, on May 30th, 2018, during a press conference at the Ukrainian Secret Service, Babchenko emerged from the crowd and walked in front of cameras, revealing himself to be alive and well. The Ukrainian Secret Service, more commonly known as the SBU, explained that they'd faked Babchenko's assassination to expose Ukrainian assassins. According to them, a few months before the murders, the SBU had received information that a suspect in eastern Ukraine named Boris Herman was hiring assassins to kill Babchenko. According to them, a man named Alexei Symbaliuk was approached by Boris Herman and was asked to carry out Babchenko's assassination. Symbaliuk had told Herman that he would do it, but instead immediately went to the SBU to report the scheme. In the following weeks, Symbaliuk would continue getting information from Herman, who didn't know Symbaliuk was working with the SBU. Subsequent footage was even released of Herman giving Symbaliuk the money for his services. The SBU then contacted Babchenko and told him about the plot before coming up with a plan to fake his assassination in an attempt to expose the assassins. On the day of the fake death, Babchenko had been covered in pig's blood and blood clots to simulate real blood before being put into an ambulance and taken to a mortuary where he cleaned himself up and prepared for the press conference. The SBU managed to track Boris Herman down and arrest him as he was about to flee the country for Italy. Marcus Schrenker was, by all accounts, a successful businessman. He had graduated from Purdue University in 1994 with a double major, before pursuing his passion in flying. 
Marcus enjoyed his time in the air as an escape from middle-class debt that was slowly accumulating after university. By the early 1990s, Marcus had taken a job as a financial planner in Indianapolis, but didn't experience much success. Sitting in a tight cubicle with a small headset alongside dozens of other workers didn't make as much money as Marcus was hoping, so he decided to use his background in aviation to give himself an advantage. He started catering to other pilots, making sales for life insurance policies. Before he knew it, Marcus was raking in thousands of dollars per phone call. The slight edge that Marcus had meant everything, but for some clients, it wasn't enough. From a young age, Marcus had a tendency to create little white lies to get people to trust him. He'd sometimes tell clients that he'd worked as a commercial pilot for American Airlines and that he'd been in the Air Force, both of which were not true. This practice of fabricating stories to attract more clients would catch up to him in the near future. Before the meantime, Marcus was rich. He became adapted to his lifestyle of expensive cars and private planes, buying a $4 million waterfront home in Geist, Indianapolis, a wealthy suburb commonly referred to as Cocktail Cove. Apart from his riches, he valued his family, and by this time, he had three children. But Marcus especially valued his wife, Michelle Daly, who he met in the junior year of university. His newfound wealth allowed him to continue his hobby as a stunt pilot, often arguing with his wife about the dangers of the profession. But Marcus's wealth and luck would soon run out. In 2008, his devious practices would come to light, which by now had developed from white lies into full-blown Ponzi schemes. Various investigations by U.S. authorities led to the raiding of Marcus's home by Indiana State Police on December 31st, where they had seized all of Marcus's records, the Indiana Department of Insurance had even filed a motion to revoke Marcus's license and fine him, forcing him to pay a fee as high as $500,000. Realizing that he was facing at least a decade in prison and thousands of dollars in lawsuits, Marcus decided that his only option was to fake his own death. He was planning to fly his plane, a Piper Meridian, from Indianapolis to Florida. While his plane would fly over Alabama, Marcus planned to jump out of the aircraft and let the plane continue on autopilot until it would eventually crash in the Gulf of Mexico. He'd reasoned that since the plane would end up at the bottom of a body of water, authorities wouldn't question the lack of a body. So, on January 11, 2009, Marcus took off the runway at Anderson Municipal Airport and climbed to a cruising altitude of 24,000 feet. About an hour into the flight, while he was approaching his jump site in Alabama, Marcus sent out a fake distress call, claiming that his windshield had cracked and that he was facing severe turbulence. Remember, eight Delta Charlie, Roger. Uh, go ahead and descend, and we'll try to work it out for you. I got down. My windshield is cracking. Roger, descend. I'm sorry, sir. That was unreal. Try one more time, please. I think he said they have a broke windshield. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's what we're trying to figure out. We're going to play it towards the ocean. Towards the Gulf. You're going towards the Gulf now, you say? I'm bleeding profusely. Then made double tell there, Roger. There's that part at 1 o'clock and 5 miles. If you can turn any of that off, sir. God damn, he's going to crash. It's Robbins Field, sir. Yes, yeah, sir, we got Robbins Field at about 1 o'clock and about 5 miles, sir, if you can do any kind of maneuvering. Hey, Della Charlie, did you copy that? He says controls were locked up. He's not turning. He says his controls were locked up. The windshield came in on it. He says he's bleeding, bleeding profusely. Bleeding profusely, too. In response, two F-15 Eagles from the Air Force were sent to intercept the plane. By this time, Marcus was ready to eject from the aircraft. However, complications with the opening of the cockpit door led to his only parachute being shredded. But by the time he'd noticed this, he was already free-falling towards the Coosa River in Alabama. At around 10 p.m. the same day, Marcus's aircraft had exhausted its fuel and crashed into a forested area in Blackwater River, Florida. Because the cockpit door had been left open when Marcus jumped, the aircraft had crashed earlier than planned. 
This meant that when the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office located the crash site, they could easily identify that something was wrong. No blood or cracked windshield were found, and because there was no evidence to conclude that anything had actually gone wrong in the plane, police started getting suspicious. Marcus had landed 300 kilometers away from his plane. The remnants of Marcus's parachute had slowed down his fall into the forest near Coosa River, which was the only thing separating Marcus and the city of Childersburg. For the next few hours, Marcus successfully attempted to get across the river and into the city, where he stumbled into a parking lot of Kangaroo Express, a gas station just a few hundred meters from the river he just climbed out of. With blood dripping down his legs from the freefall, Marcus found himself in the presence of two police officers, and with Marcus's confused state, they'd assumed that Marcus was just drunk, and drove him to the nearest motel, a mere nine kilometers away, where security camera footage caught these pictures of Marcus checking into the hotel under a false name. Across the street from the motel was the storage unit that Marcus had used to hide his motorcycle. Marcus drove to a camping ground in northern Florida, and upon realizing that it wouldn't take long for police to track him down, he decided to swallow a handful of his oxycodone medication and sent an email to his colleague back in Indianapolis, Tom Britt. Since then, transcripts of the email have surfaced online, showing Marcus continuing to fabricate his story. He claims that the window on his plane imploded and that he was bleeding out. He admitted to making up a fake name to check into the motel back in Alabama, but blamed the fall of his company on his colleagues. After sending the email, Marcus attempted to commit suicide by cutting himself multiple times. However, because he hadn't paid his campsite rental fee, the owner of the campsite came to his tent, and upon seeing Marcus laying in a pool of his own blood, he called the Gadsden Sheriff's Office. Marcus was then flown to a hospital in Tallahassee, where he was brought back to a stable state. Marcus's subsequent court case was heavily reported on, with various news outlets just now learning about his disappearance. A man who confessed to faking his own death is headed to federal prison. Indiana financial investor Marcus Schrenker parachuted out of his plane, leaving it to crash near... He was sentenced to around four years in prison in federal court, and 20 years in Indiana, but in the end, he'd only serve around five years in total. To this day, Marcus denies having the intention to fake his death and claims that he was planning to commit suicide by crashing his plane, but overwhelming evidence negates this claim. Suicide remains an elusive topic that has interested many. Although the idea of faking your own death has been sensationalized and popularized throughout the media, these stories, along with countless others, prove that it's not as easy as it's made out to be, and the consequences of a failed attempt can be damning. However, we may have several examples of those who failed we can never truly know the number of those who succeeded, because more often than not, they are never heard from again.